everything we have to fear is in war. Fear there is no substitute for victory. Let us never negotiate out of fear. We stand undivided, forever united, fighting hand in hand for the liberty we burn, for glory and honor for our sons and daughters, ever mindful of the lessons we've learned. Let the torch of freedom burn. Welcome to the intersection of faith and politics. This is Wall Builders Live with David Barton and Rick Green. Thanks for joining us today. Visit online at wallbuilders.com and wallbuilderslive.com. David, we talk about everything from a biblical and historical point of view. One of the things we have to talk about when dealing with Patriot Academy or other youth programs out there is the importance of, of challenging young people to take their faith out in the community and, and have an impact on the world. Uh, Michael Youssef had a great article recently, Dr. Michael Youssef, on the fact that, unfortunately, there are some Christians that are doing that, but we've become almost wimpy. That's not the word he used, but in reading the article, I, that's the impression that I got, and it's true. We just, uh, so much of the church has just backed off. We're so afraid people are going to say uh, mean things about us if we stand for biblical principles. It, we're operating from a position of fear these days. We are, and one of the things is, if you if you look at where we are in the nation now, the secular evangelists have done a much better job of wanting Christians to be secularists than Christians have done wanting secularists to be Christians. Mm. Rather than Christians turning over secular colleges and having revivals, it is secularists turning over Christian colleges and killing belief in Bible. Man. So we, we I mean, their evangelists are much more effective than our evangelists are. It, Man, you're right. I mean, in fact, that's what Dr. Yusuf talks about in the article is how on Christian campuses— you have a handful of of, of liberal students that uh, LGBT students that go after the the college and manage to get policies changed to be anti biblical on Christian colleges. Yeah, the, the evangelists for their faith and their beliefs they're much more effective than we are for ours because we really don't want to offend anybody. Because if we offend someone, they won't listen to our message, and it's all about love. And if we can just get them converted to Christ, and they they we, they won't do that if they don't listen to us. And they won't listen to us if they don't love us. And they won't love us if we do things that offend them. And, and so we, we we just can't do that. And, and so it's all about acceptance. We want to be accepted by them. And, and to be accepted by them, we, we've got to we've got to talk the way they want us to talk. You know, one of the one of the Bible verses I learned about acceptance early on, and it's really good. And because we get into this thing of, oh, we want all the kids to be accepted. So we don't want to give awards and we don't want to have trophies and we want to have ribbons because, you know, they feel like there's winners and losers and we want everybody to be accepted. Here, here's the great verse on acceptance that every adult, every kid ought to learn and memorize. It's Genesis 4, 7. And it deals with Cain and Abel. And Cain and Abel, it, God said that he accepted Abel's sacrifice, but he did not like Cain's sacrifice. He rejected Cain's sacrifice, but he accepted Abel's. You mean he didn't give him a fifth place or eighth place or twelfth place ribbon? He didn't even place, because there's only one winner, and it was Abel. And it's really interesting, because what you had with Abel, it says Abel brought God the first fruits of his flock, and it said Cain, after a course of days, brought the, the his crops. So Cain got around to giving some God something, but Abel did it the first thing off. Abel went to God first thing, said, here's the the first fruits of my flock. I'm honoring you with the first things I get. And Cain said, let me look over everything, and I'll, I'll see what I want to take out, and then I'll give God what's, what's left over. Well, God liked what Abel did. He didn't like what Cain did. And so when Cain got really angry, I love what God told him. Here's what God told him in Genesis 4, 7. He says, if you do what's right, won't you be accepted too? But if you do not do what's right, sin is crouching at your door, desires to have you, but you must rule over it. And you learn that acceptance comes from doing what's right. So what happened is, Cain, if you want to be accepted, do the right thing. Don't don't, don't worry about attitudes. The, the attitude is, if you'll do the right thing, then you'll be accepted. And it may not be accepted by the culture, but you will be accepted by God. And once you get accepted by God, your conscience bears witness with you. The Holy Spirit bears witness with you. God will stand up for you in eternity. That's really important stuff. And so we've gotten more into wanting to be accepted by people than accepted by God, and therefore we don't do what's right. And so that, that Cain and Abel lesson, when God told Cain, if you want to be accepted, you do what's right, then you will be accepted. 
That's what we got to learn in the church. That's what we have to learn on campuses. That's what Christian campuses are going to have to learn. You do what's right. Even if it ticks people off, you do what's right because you'll be accepted with God. If you get accepted with God, you'll have favor. If God gives you favor, then you will grow. You will prosper. Things will go the right direction. If you compromise those values, you won't have favor with God or with man, and you'll lose everything you're trying to save. The author of the article that brought up this conversation will be with us when we come back, Dr. Michael Youssef, right here on Wobblers Live. This is David Barton with another moment from America's history. Joseph Story is one of the most important names in American jurisprudence. Not only was he placed on the U.S. Supreme Court by President James Madison, but he also founded Harvard Law School and authored numerous legal works on the Constitution. While today's revisionists claim that the goal of the First Amendment was absolute religious pluralism, Justice Joseph Story vehemently disagreed. He declared, The real object of the First Amendment was not to encourage much less to advance Mohammedanism or Judaism or infidelity by prostrating Christianity, but was to exclude all rivalry among Christian denominations. According to founder Joseph Story, Christianity, not pluralism, was the goal of the Founding Fathers in the First Amendment, for only a Christian nation is tolerant and thus is truly pluralistic. For more information on God's hand in American history, contact Wall Builders at 1-800-8-REBUILD. Welcome back. Thanks for staying with us here on Wall Builders Live. Back with us, our good friend, Dr. Michael Youssef. Good to have you back, sir. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, Rick. Good to be with you. Thank you for having me. Hey, great article on anti-biblical minorities taking the change the world baton. Scary, scary idea, but it is absolutely happening. We seem to have disempowered the youth in, in the uh, Christian community. Yeah, we have surrendered our birthright when that was said of 12 fishermen that they've turned their world upside down. Their world was no other than the powerful Roman Empire. And yet, uh, today, we having these uh, lobby uh, groups who are working behind the scenes, turning around uh, historic institutions and Christian colleges uh, from following the truth of the Word of God and the absolute Word of God into uh, giving into culture and culture pressure. Yeah, you mentioned in the article that the underlying reason is is fear that, that that our image will be tarnished by being labeled as haters and bigots. That seems to be the weapon that is working so well. I know, and the devil knows exactly what he's doing. He he basically made us to be want to be liked so much by the world. Never mind how the Lord Himself feels <laughs> uh, that we surrender the moment we become uh, falsely accused of anything. I mean, it just uh, uh, all they say is, oh, he's a bigot, or he's a racist, or he's a this, and, and he's a that. And some, even some people call me racist one time, and I'm an African <laughs> for writing something about President Obama that was nothing about him personally, but about something he did, and about an action. And so, <laughs> I mean, if, if a guy who's born in Africa is a racist when he criticizes uh, an action by somebody who happened to be half African. Uh, now this is just, it's free for all. Yeah. It seems like, you know, we, we say the truth will set you free. And it, it, if you get past their lies and distortions and, and uh, their accusations that absolutely are true, then you'll realize that it, that we are standing on truth and we should not back down. How do we, how do we get that across to the church today? Well, I think that there's, there is no way to be able to do this without uh, engendering misunderstanding, and, and that's fine. As long as we accept the fact that there is price for victory, <laughs> that there is a price to be paid, that we should not be afraid to pay a price. If our Savior himself gave up the glories of heaven and, and crucified for us in order that he may redeem us, what are a few false accusations I mean, he said, in fact, Jesus said, blessed are you when they falsely accuse you. Mm. We seem to forget that. Mm. We don't want to be falsely accused. And, and so we say, well, we, we, we give them the upper hand when the, allow them to falsely accuse us. Well, worry about what God thinks, number one. Secondly, 
you know, in, in the scripture, it's very clear. You know, we talk about all these uh, Hollywood stars. The Bible said those who are stars, like Daniel, when, when he was talking to him, they said those are the people who uphold righteousness. So would I be a star on earth and for a few uh, uh, vain days, or should I be more concerned about, oh, I'm going to be a star in heaven in the presence of the great God and Savior, Lord Jesus Christ? I think we have lost sight of what the gospel is all about. That's really the bottom line. We think, and here's the deception, that in order, we think that in order to win people to Christ, we literally have to be just like them. And the problem is when we got neutralized, when the power of the gospel got neutralized by our trying to imitate them and try to live like them, we'll never lead them to Christ. We'll lead them to some way, maybe to a church, to an emerging church or something like that, but not, not to Christ. Man, you said so many things there that are so powerful. I got I got to break it down now and, and back up, make sure I get all these. So first thing you said is to that, that we should be fearing God, not them. Maybe it starts with that that we no longer fear God the way that we should. And if we if we did, then we would be more concerned with pleasing Him and doing it His way than pleasing the world. Absolutely, and the Scripture is very clear. They said, you know, the the the, the really the, the the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. And I'm not talking about like. People say, oh, you mean ter- terrified of God. No, absolute in awe yeah. and, and respect and reverence that I care about what he thinks more than what I care about what Hollywood thinks, and I care about what he says more than what I, think, I care about what the culture thinks. That is really what the fear of God is all about. And the reason we don't have wisdom today is because we don't fear God. No longer do we stand in awe of who he is and what he said and how can we please him and therefore, we are living in foolishness. It goes from the from from um, from every house to the White House. I mean, we uh, to, and, and to the State House. We have no wisdom. We are now operating by man's wisdom, and this a folly as far as God is concerned. And that is really going to get us into. I've just um, uh, I've finished a new book. Uh, it's called Jesus, Jihad, and Peace, which will be coming out in a couple of months' time by uh, worthy publishers. And, and, and in that book, I explain that just as Israel risked being taken into exile by their disobedience to God and refusal to repent, we are having that scourge of terrorism and all the other isms that are going on in our culture. We, we, are, in, we are experiencing that scourge simply because we have also forsaken the God of our fathers. Our guest today is Dr. Michael Youssef from the Church of the Apostles in Atlanta, Georgia. Stay with us back in a moment on Wall Builders Live. This is David Barton with another moment from America's history. Revisions today often assert that our founding fathers were atheists or agnostics or deists. This charge is not new. In fact, Patrick Henry was even called a deist in his lifetime. Clearly, no one could question his patriotism, but Henry was hurt that they would question his Christianity. Against the charge that he was a deist, Patrick Henry thundered, Deism with me is but another name for vice and depravity. I hear it is said by the deist that I am one of their number, and indeed that some good people think I am no Christian. This thought gives me much more pain than being called a traitor. Being a Christian is a character which I prize far above all this world has or can boast. Patrick Henry was quick to refute the charge of deism and to declare his open belief as a Christian. For more information on God's hand in American history, contact Wall Builders at 1-800-8-REBUILD. Welcome back. Thanks for staying with us here on Wild Builders Live. Dr. Michael Youssef is with us from Church of the Apostles in Atlanta, Georgia. We're talking about just the the, the fact that that we as Christians have have bought the lie and the false accusations and and, and cowered down uh, and stopped standing for truth because of that. And and uh, Dr. Youssef, you were you were already talking about the fact that if we fear God, if we're in awe of God, we won't do that. And the, and, and the second thing you mentioned that was so powerful, you said the that being falsely accused. I mean, Jesus said you're going to be falsely accused. So maybe instead of fearing that, we should embrace that and say that means we're doing what He told us to do. So when we get that false accusation, praise the Lord. That means I'm doing what He called me to do. 
Exactly. Now, yes, and and then there is a there is a unique blessing. He said, "Makarios, blessed are you." I mean, you're going to have a unique blessing when you are falsely accused for Jesus' sake. When people basically twist our words and accuse us, and they don't see our, our, our actions and our heart and the fact that we love them so dearly that we want to share the greatest treasure that we could ever share with anybody. And when they twist those things, then just leave them to God. You hand them over, let God deal with them. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, not for ours, but for him. Vengeance is mine. Let him handle it. Just keep on loving them. Keep on speaking the truth. I mean, there's just a way. It, it, I, I've been trying to. I was part of a mainline denomination when I left 24 years ago. And, uh, and actually, I didn't leave. They asked me to leave <laughs> because they couldn't take every time I get to speak. They'll boo me. And, uh, and 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 it, in the end, I said, look, Lord, if you want me to do this for the rest of my life, I'm happy to do it. And came the answer from them. They said, no, 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 you get out of here. So <laughs> but I said, well, I get out of here, and I keep saying the same thing. I ain't going to stop. And, Inside, outside, doesn't matter. And now, and now, and and heard all over the world, 200 different countries, 3,800 times a week. I mean, that it, it's uh, God's really blessed you in that. And I, I'm wondering too. I mean, you you started your article talking about the youth. Is there a way, Doctor Yusuf, to to tap that that I guess natural desire to kind of be countercultural or be the rebel at that age, and show them that hey, that's you get to be you get to stand up for truth and for God's word and be countercultural at the same time. You get to be the rebel by being someone that stands for the Lord. Exactly, and I really, I'm, I mean, having generalized, I know there are many, many ministries, and there are many young men and women who are absolutely standing firm, paying a price. And I want to salute them, and I, I, want, to, I want to thank God for them. And I'm praying that God will, will increase their tribe, because, I mean, they are there. I know some of them personally, and I know they come and they talk to me, and they tell me about the price they pay on campus or whatever workplace. But uh, So we, we, we are thankful for them, but uh, in terms of what we need to really be praying for it's for some movement of the Holy Spirit to come in and, and really become like a wave that will sweep this falsehood uh, away and, 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 and in, increase uh, the number of those quiet, timid Christians who are behind, you know, saying, yeah, 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 but I'm afraid to come out, to be encouraged and to come out, and they become faithful believers and unashamed of the gospel. I, I really think that oh, we need to be praying for that. Amen. Amen. And again, it comes back to that fear of the Lord. If, we, if, we, if we're in awe of him, we're not going to be so concerned about what the world thinks. And we're going to spend more time in his word, which means the truth is going to uh, be, be placed in our heart and we'll be able to see through the lies and the, and the false accusations. Exactly. And when you think about, and I know Bana is not perfect, but, but when you think of not just him, but all the other statistics shows that 60% of those who claim to be born-again Christians believe that there are many ways to God, and Jesus is not the only way. You know, we are in deep trouble. Forty percent of those who claim to be believers in Jesus uh, truly believe the essence of the gospel, namely that Jesus and Jesus alone, through whom salvation uh, is and possible, and, and that he's the only one who can take you to heaven. I mean, when you give up on that foundational truth, that, 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 that 60 percent is not real. They're not really believers. Mm. Before I let you go, now when will when will the book come out? Uh, Jesus, Jihad, and Peace. It, it will be out in about three months' time. A worthy Publishing is publishing it, and uh, it should be uh, on Amazon uh, but before the end of the year. Excellent, excellent. Well, Doctor Youssef, God bless you, brother. We so enjoy having you on. Look forward to getting you back soon. Thank you, Rick. God bless. Stay with us here on Wobbler's Live. Have you ever wanted to learn more about the United States Constitution but just felt like, man, the classes are boring or it's just that old language from 200 years ago or I don't know where to start? People want to know, but it gets frustrating because you don't know where to look for truth about the Constitution either. Well, we've got a special program for you available now called Constitution Alive with David Barton and Rick Green. And it's actually a teaching done on the Constitution at Independence Hall in the very room where the Constitution was framed. 
We take you both to Philadelphia, the Cradle of Liberty and Independence Hall, and to the Wall Builders Library, where David Barton brings the history to life to teach the original intent of our founding fathers. We call it the Quick Start Guide to the Constitution because in just a few hours through these videos, you will learn the Citizen's Guide to America's Constitution. You'll learn what you need to do to help save our constitutional republic. It's fun, it's entertaining, and it's going to inspire you to do your part to preserve freedom for future generations. It's called Constitution Alive with David Barton and Rick Green. You can find out more information on our website now at wallbuilders.com. Let the torch of freedom burn. Welcome back. Thanks for staying with us here on Wall Builders Live. Special thanks to Dr. Michael Youssef for joining us on the program today as well. David, basically the same thing you said as we were uh, going to the interview with Dr. Youssef in, in terms of you do what's right, you'll be accepted. And Dr. Youssef saying, hey, you, you don't have that fear of God. You're not going to have wisdom. If you fear him first, then you'll do what's right and stop worrying about whether or not the world accepts you. By the way, let me just ask you a, a question. This has to do with stereotypes and the way that we tend to stereotype people and put them in categories based on what we think. Um, you may know this. I'm going to act like you don't because I don't know that you've ever seen this before. Uh, do you know what denominational faith Yusuf is associated with? I don't. No, I really don't. You heard him. What do you think? Oh, uh, man. I mean, he talked about a major denomination. I, I'm going to guess. Wow. I, I, I'm going to guess either. Uh, either um, Baptist or um, man, he would it wouldn't be a. It wouldn't be like Episcopalian, would it? I'm just asking. You heard him. He's a Bible thumper. What do you think? Hmm. Assembly of God. Anglican. No kidding. See, when I, when I started to say Episcopalian, I was thinking, you know, I can't I can't imagine he's like a high church kind of guy. This this is the church of George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. This is the church of James Wilson and, and James Madison. An Anglican church. Now, people have stereotypes of what Anglicans are and what they do. He's got an Anglican church of 3,000 members in Georgia. He is exceptionally evangelical, as you heard. He knows the Bible up and down. Mm, that's what Anglicans always had been. That's what Anglicans were. That's what they were in the American founding. That's not what they've become today. But again, we have a, a, a tendency to stereotype people based on what we think they are. Nobody would have thought, you know, just like that wasn't your first guess was Anglican. And probably nobody who heard him would say that was Anglican. But just recognize it. It's not about the denomination. It's about what he knows about the Bible. But I do find it interesting that that's the, that's the church that Washington and all the other founding fathers from Virginia, particularly in South Carolina and other places down there, that was their church. And, and that was typical of what your church had been back in the early days. Wow, that, yeah, that, yeah, I'm, now I know why you were, I was sitting there thinking, why is he asking me this question? Now I know, I would have never guessed that in a million years, but it is our, I guess, our misperception of the founding era churches, and I mean, you're talking about, hey, they must have been uh, a, a little bit more, uh, shall we say, aggressive than we like to picture them today, if they, I mean, they led to a revolution, right? Right, and see, that that's the interesting thing about it, is because we have a tendency to do what's called modernism. And we have a tendency to base to judge things from the past based on what we know of them in the present. And but what we know of the Anglican Church today and what the Archbishop of Canterbury has done in England, who's head of the Anglican Church, and, and what he said about, yeah, we, we think Muslim is great. We think Sharia law should be part of the Anglican Church. I mean, based on that kind of stuff, you go, golly, Anglicans. Wow, Washington was an Anglican. Boy, he didn't believe anything, did he? And then you find, no, here's what the Anglican Church did believe. And if you want to find some really powerful sermons, read Whitfield, who was an Anglican, became a Methodist, but he was an Anglican. He was ordained as an Anglican. So you have so many of these guys in the Great Awakening that, that had that background, but based on what we know today, we judge wrong. We judge backwards. And so that's that's the thing we've talked on, on the program before. You, you judge a tree by its fruit, not by its labels. You know, if you run around saying, I'm an Anglican, everybody gets a stereotype of what they think that means, but you can't do that. And so Michael's a great example of what an Anglican had been for hundreds of years, uh, what the Anglican Church needs to become today, very, very Bible-centered, Bible-oriented. And by the way, if you have a Bible-centered, Bible-oriented church, he's got 3,000 members. Now, find me another Anglican church in America with 3,000 members. I doubt there is one. I doubt there is one, too, but they don't preach the way he preaches. And so that is the difference. So having said that, I mean, he, he's exactly right on this. 
Acceptance does not come from being liked or from a lack of conflict. And that's where the church thinks it's supposed to be today. We'll be accepted if we'll avoid conflict and if we can make everybody like us. That's not it. I mean, the truth sets us free. That's for sure. But we're also told time and time and time in the scriptures to be strong, be of good courage, be courageous. And that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to have some backbone and stand up and stand for something. And I love what Michael said. He said, we've lost sight of what the gospel is all about. And we have. I mean, Jesus said, hey, sorry, guys, I came to bring a sword. What I'm going to tell you is going to divide a family against a family. It's going to divide a mother against her daughters and a father against a son. It's going to divide a husband against a wife. When you hear what I've got to say, there's going to be a lot of people who won't like this and it's going to create a lot of division. But it's the truth. And see, that was the gospel that Jesus brought. And it's not that we're trying to offend people. It's we're trying to please God and we're trying to proclaim the truth. And, man, that's what we're losing on campuses and churches across the nation. You know, what's interesting about all that, David, is that, that we're so afraid of offending. But in, in, in reality, I really think people are what they're really tired of and offended by is the wishy-washy yeah. kind of mamsy-pamsy message. Well, how many how many people do we know in Congress that do not represent their districts, but they keep getting reelected because people know exactly where they stand and therefore they're dependable and trustworthy? We have a congressman here in Texas who's out of step with 60 percent of his district, yet they keep reelecting him because they know what he stands for. He's dependable. He won't surprise them. He's up front and he's very courageous with what he says. And even though they don't agree with him with 60 percent, they trust him. And, and that's what you get when you stand and have backbone and have courage. People want somebody that's got backbone and leadership as opposed to somebody that's a jellyfish or, as Hutch used to say, an evan jellyfish. Yeah. That's not who they want. Yeah, no doubt about it. No doubt. Well, special thanks to Dr. Michael Youssef for joining us today. We'll have a link to the article at our website today at wallbuilderslive.com. You've been listening to Wall Builders Live. We stand undivided.